Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Sarkis Masmanian, who is Professor of Microbiology at the California Institute of Technology. His research aims to discover how gut bacteria influence the development and function of the immune and nervous systems with the goal of understanding mechanisms by which the microbiome contributes to the critical balance between health and disease. Welcome, Sargas. Thank you for having me, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your older papers uh, from 2013. Microbiota modulate behavioral and psychological uh, physiological abnormalities associated with neurodevelopmental disorders. You say neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorder, ASD, are defined by core behavioral impairments. However, subsets of individuals display a spectrum of gastrointestinal GI abnormalities. Now, this has been in the news for a while. Uh, people were very fascinated by microbiome and, and uh, the health implications of that. Uh, but you have been doing research in this area for a long time. So even from 2013, um, early 2000s, I think uh, these ideas have been, have been there, right? There's some connection between the gut bacteria and possibly some of the CNS, um, CNS issues. Yeah, yes, there is. And I would still say that we know very little, even in 2021, about um, how the microbiome or let's say just even you know, events in the gut that may involve diet or exposure to the environment impact uh, neurological function uh, and the brain, specifically in the context of behavior. Um, it's it's a, an interesting topic, but it's one that that's even in animal models where most of the research is done. And I think this is also important is that, you know, we know more about this connection as little as we know. We know more about this connection in mice than we still know in humans. But um, it, it's, a, again, a, a new but, a, but an emerging and exciting area. Now, ASD, autism spectrum disorder, um, do we have a, a reasonable animal models for that? I would argue that there are no good animal models for autism spectrum disorder because the disorder itself is based on, uh, in humans obviously, is based on um, diagnosis of particular behaviors or evaluation of particular behaviors. There is no you know, s- you know, brain scan to diagnose autism or its severity. There's no blood test, you know, unlike many other disorders. So it's very hard to model human behaviors in mice. So mice socialize, mice communicate, uh, mice have met, you know, many behaviors, but their behaviors are different than ours. So in many ways, I think that there is, I would argue there's no mouse model of, of autism. What we're modeling are mouse behaviors, which are correlative to human behaviors, which then lends itself to the notion that, you know, mouse models, while informative 
are probably not going to be in the long run are probably not going to be uh, as useful as human research in autism. So, what kind of mice behavior are we talking about? Uh, as you know, when we consider ASD. So ASD is diagnosed uh, by deficits in social communication and repetitive behavior. And social communication can mean both verbal communication and all the other means that we use to communicate. Facial expressions, hand gestures, you know, know, just uh, body language. We, We, you know, it's interesting how we as humans communicate in ways that don't always use words. Uh, and, and individuals with autism just don't have the robustness or they have a delay in either learning or executing all of the different modalities we use to communicate. And, um, and a repetitive behavior in humans is, you know, the, the essentially a, 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 a desire to repeat the same, the same actions or the same activities or the same routines. And so just as I described, and I think it's inherent and and obvious to to your audience, is when we talk about, you know, various forms of communication, we and mice communicate differently. So what we try and do in animal models is to try is to try and capture um, both vocal communication. So we use ultrasonic vocalization measurements so we can essentially at the ultrasonic wavelength understand how mice are, are you know, or quantitate how mice are communicating to each other. But we also look at social communication or physical communication, which involves nose to nose touching of mice, which involves crawling and pushing. Uh, These are all parameters that we score to understand how two mice are socializing with each other. And then we also use specific tasks to see how often a mouse repeats the same activity such as grooming themselves or burying a marble. And so again, we're using, we're trying to model human traits in mice, but we use paradigms or tests that are actually looking at mouse behaviors. That's fascinating. So is anxiety um, sort of a a marker for this? Anxiety can be modeled in in mice. Obviously anxiety um, is a human trait that, uh, is both complex and, you know, you know, not just associated with autism, but but is quite prevalent in in the the population, and so we can model anxiety in mice by essentially putting mice into what would be, um, you know, daring or um, frightening situations and looking at their response and measuring their response. So for example, how much time does a mouse spend in the light versus the dark part of a behavioral paradigm, right? Because the light is more, uh, would cause more anxiety than being in darkness where mice feel safer. And so again, we can model these, these traits using mouse specific paradigms and, uh, and correlate them to their cognate behaviors in humans. But of course, those be fundamentally mice and, and, and humans behave differently. Yeah. You say in the paper, um, Sarkis, that uh, you demonstrate GI barrier defects and microbiota alterations in the maternal immune activation mouse model that is known to display features of ASD. Um, and so the, when we think about micro, um, uh, microbiome, microbiota, it is uh, the the child gets it from the from the mother, right? Uh, that is so. You get a set of initial conditions, and then it goes from there. Uh, we are we and mice do share uh, uh, the a similar feature is that we and all animals inherit their microbiomes from their mothers, um, or all mammals and inherit their microbiomes from their mothers initially, but over time develop their microbiomes by exposure to other individuals and to the environment. And in humans, um, uh, it's known that uh, it takes about two to three years uh, of this, you know, exposure to the environment and obviously the the changing diet in that uh, timeframe for the microbiome to essentially stabilize. After about three years of life, the microbiome looks um, uh, adult-like, if you will. The first three years, it looks very different, but after three years, it looks adult-like, and you know, and then it persists. It doesn't mean the microbiome it stays the same, 
uh, you know, th you know, throughout lifespan. Clearly, the microbiome changes over time, but it is those first three years that essentially set that initial microbiome. Mm. And so if you are, I know that we're still, uh, still early into this research, but if you are able to um, create a connection between GI abnormalities coming from microbiome and ultimately ASD, ASD is more difficult to, um, difficult to measure, but I would imagine the GI aspects uh, would be more measurable, right? There are objective tools to measure um, GI function um, and uh, and quantitate GI activity, you know, gastrointestinal activity. So one can um, essentially measure transit time objectively yep. uh, by using uh, various means. More more recently, uh, people will use a smart pill. It's a device that is swallowed and transits through the the intestines and. Is ultimately excreted, but you know it sends a signal to the iPhone uh, that allows us to measure the transit time. And then the other objective biomarker or the objective endpoints in um, uh, uh, gastrointestinal function would be questionnaires about about you know abdominal pain, bloating, you know bowel habits, what have you. And then the third measure, which is objective, is the analysis of stool to look at stool consistency, texture, color. Um, these are all ways, and it's a good question that you ask, these are all ways to get objective, uh, and that's why I, I emphasize that point, objective out point, uh, uh, um, uh, endpoints, because in the absence of a scan or, or, a, or a blood test, the behavioral endpoints are very variable depending on who administers the test, depending on the time of day, depending on the mood of the individual, the scores can vary widely. That's why you know, ASC is both challenging to, to diagnose and to treat, and that's why we look for more objective biomarkers. Yeah, so assuming, uh, Sarkis, at some point we get reasonable confidence that the mouse model can translate into humans, do, do you see... Um, do you see a way to sort of early diagnosis of ASD in humans uh, through GI measurements and then possible corrections? Um, it might be speculation right now, but is, do you think that's possible? Uh, probably. I, I would bench. I mean, anything's possible because <laughs> it's a new area and, and these, these hypotheses have, have not been tested. Um, I would say that you know, it may be challenging because uh, for a number of reasons is um, initially the, the GI issues or the gastrointestinal issues aren't in every individual with autism. Uh, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's in a subset, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. So about half half of the autism population have some form of gastrointestinal issues. And even then, in that 50 percent, it ranges. Not every child has the same symptoms. Some have constipation, some have alternating constipation, diarrhea, some have bloating, some have abdominal cramps, like we just mentioned. Um, yeah. So there's variability there. Secondly, it's unknown at what time point these symptoms arise because A, it hasn't been studied, and B, uh, most individuals with autism don't express themselves and they don't tell you. And, and so it's hard, you know, we don't know. So you'd have to essentially survey a large population with these objective biomarkers. What I think may be more likely is not as a potential diagnostic. Um, and again, this is, this is still remains unproven. Wouldn't be GI, wouldn't be gastrointestinal or, or gut habits or movement, but maybe something along the lines of what molecules are being produced by the gut bacteria. And so essentially looking at small molecules or metabolites, a molecular fingerprint, if you will, of the microbiome that may be specific to autism. Again, I want to be very clear. This is a, a, a notion. It's a hypothesis. There's no empiric evidence from humans to suggest that this is the case. But I think that based on what we know from the animal models, there may be a higher likelihood that one can diagnose autism by looking at the molecules produced by gut bacteria. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know a lot about this, Sarkis, but so does this mean that autism, it takes some time to set in? Um, it is not really, you know, sort of genetically transferred. 
if you have certain conditions, assuming you know the the microbiome, GI to brain connection, are all proven out, that it takes some time for the for the disease to set in. Autism is a genetic disorder, Gil, and and it is, uh, um, and there's a lot of evidence for that. You know, the, I think the strongest evidence would be that the concordance of disease between monozygotic twins is very high, suggesting yeah. that if you share a, a similar genetic landscape, you're more likely to to share that same outcome. So it is a genetic disorder. Um, the, the nature of the mutations, the nature of the, the identities of the genes, how those mutations affect brain development function or any other aspect of the body um, in, during development is very much under investigation and also very much, uh, you know, different among different people. There's over 160 genes that have already been associated with autism. And if you aggregate all of the individuals who have one mutation in any of those 160 genes, we're still talking about less than 10% of the autism population. So even if those 160 genes explained autism, and we don't know that they explain autism, they would only explain 10% of autism. So we have a lot to learn about the genetics of autism. However, and it does manifest very early in life. There are in some individuals, in, in cases that tend to be severe, there can be diagnosis even as early as a year of age, um, and in some cases by 18 months, though the average uh, age of diagnosis is still around three and a half or four years of age these days. But that's a lot of that could be due to so social factors as well. And the way we view, so again, autism being a genetic disorder, the way we view the contribution of the microbiome is that it's a modifier of the outcome that is that is set by genetics. In other words, a person could have a particular uh, set of mutation or a particular uh, 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 genome or, or genetic landscape that might make them more or less susceptible to the effects of the microbiome. And if a person has, let's say, a, predisp a genetic predisposition to autism and they have an altered microbiome, then they may manifest more severe disease. And so again, you know, we view you know, a lot of this is, is still speculative and, and experimental, but we view the microbiome as a modifier of autism, not as a, as a cause of autism. Right, right. Okay. Uh, but more generally, Sarkis, would you say that early identification of gastrointestinal abnormalities uh, could be beneficial, um, not only for ASD, but a variety of things, right? So if, if, uh, if that is identified early in babies, and uh, I don't know if there is some sort of probiotic therapy uh, that that could be that could be done. Um, is, is that sort of a general view that uh, GI portends uh, potential problems in the uh, in the in the body in a variety of areas? You know, again, it's I would I would speculate that that. Understanding a person's GI issues early in life will probably not lead to a, an understanding of their of a potential disease diagnosis later on. You know, yeah. I, and and the other issue is, you know, there are many people without autism ultimately who have G, who may have GI issues. Also, there are many disorders that are associated with GI issues, not just autism. And so, I'm not sure that that understanding the gastrointestinal issues early in life is, is going to allow us to better understand autism. Again, it might, you know, there's a possibility, but I think there's, there are just a lot of variables with that approach. A lot of variables and a lot of research still needed. I want to go into another paper you have, a gut microbiota regulate motor deficits and neuroinflammation in a model of Parkinson's disease. Um, in the, you say the intestinal microbiota influence neurodevelopment, modulate behavior, and contribute to neurological disorders. However, a functional link between gut bacteria and neurodegenerative diseases remains unexplored. Um, so this is you're talking about Parkinson's disease here, but you're talking more generally uh, a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, right? In in that paper in that in that body of work, um, we looked specifically in a mouse model of of synucleinopathy, which which in, in encompasses Parkinson's disease, 
And when that paper was published in 2016, there had been no prior report of uh, a link between the gut microbiome and neurodegeneration in any mouse model. Since our paper, there have been uh, a, a number of publications showing uh, a link between the microbiome and Parkinson's disease in mouse models and also in Alzheimer's disease. And so this, as you're referring to neurodegeneration more broadly is other laboratories, not ours, have now shown that um, the microbiome in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease uh, contributes to the hallmark pathology and contributes to cognitive decline. Uh, again, we showed in, in Parkinson's, uh, in the Parkinson's mouse model, that the gut microbiome contributes to motor symptoms, which is the hallmark feature of Parkinson's, and also to you know, various different brain outcomes, including pathology and, and neuroinflammation. Um, and now some of this work is being translated into people. And this is really very gratifying uh, for me and for the community is that the, these initial papers that have come out just in the last three or four years are being uh, leveraged to now explore some of these same uh, uh, outcomes, some of these same hypotheses in, in Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer's patients, ALS patients, uh, Huntington patients, and others. Yeah. When, when you when you say microbiome, there, there is a is it is it true that we need some sort of an optimum c- composition um, of, of the type of bacteria in there? So so you have in the in the paper you talk about germ free mice um, promoting neuroinflammation. So we we need some specific composition in there for for things to work. In humans, what we know is that there's a a huge diversity of microbes across the population, across different geographies, across different diets, um, uh, and and, uh, and even as we've discussed, across age. A person's microbiome changes as they age. Um, What is the optimum microbiome or the most healthy microbiome? I, I believe that that's a very hard question to answer because we're all different. We're all individuals. And a microbiome in me may be adapted for my health and a microbiome in you will be adapted for your health and they may look different, right? Because again, of our diet, because of our genetics, because of of other factors as well. And so very hard to identify and and, and let's say label what is a healthy microbiome. You refer to the germ-free mice in the paper. Germ-free mice are mice that have no microbiomes at all. And so that's a research tool that's not, it, that, that doesn't in any way model a human condition because there's no such thing as a person with no gut bacteria. And so when we re-derive mice under germ-free conditions, there's generally, you know, two, there's many approaches, but generally two that, that we use is initially just to implicate the microbiome in an outcome. In this case, it was motor symptoms and Parkinson's, right? So the germ-free mice had no symptoms of Parkinson's. All that tells us, it doesn't tell us what bacteria are important. It just tells us that the microbiome is important. Yeah. Again, the microbiome is made up of many hundreds of bacteria. And then the other um, uh, uh, advantage of having germ-free mice is it allows you now to test individual organisms or you know, transfer microbiomes from humans into mice. Mm-hmm. And it gives you, it's a research tool that allows us to now test the role of specific bacterial species. And that's how you get to understanding which microbes are important in a particular disease and which microbes may not affect a, a specific disease. And th- that's what you did in this experiment? We've done that uh, in a number of projects, but in the paper you're referring to, we were able to transfer microbiomes from Parkinson's patients and healthy control uh, individuals into mice and show that if we transfer microbiome from Parkinson's patients, the mice had worse motor symptoms than when we transferred microbiomes from healthy individuals that were matched in, 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 you know, as best as we could um, for all parameters. So this, what this tells us is that the Parkinson's microbiome in people may be contributing to their disease. Again, it's um, ultimately we're testing human microbes in a mouse. We're not testing human microbes in humans. So it, it, it builds evidence that the microbiome is actually contributing to disease in humans. But again, that's a starting point for for clinical trials. 
And I think this is, I think this was an important yeah. um, experiment because there's been a number of papers which have shown that the microbiome is different in a person with Parkinson's versus a healthy control, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's very powerful data to show when, you, when uh, the stool was analyzed for microbiome composition. The Parkinson's microbiome is you know, in large cohorts look different than that of healthy controls. But of course, these are, you know, while they're human studies and that makes them relevant, these are associations. It's a correlation, right? Because you say the person has a disease and they have a, a different microbiome. That doesn't mean that, that the different microbiome contributed to their disease, right? Potentially, the microbiome is altered because because of the disease, not uh, not you know the microbiome is is promoting the disease, and that's why when we did the mouse experiment, it's a way of, of functionally testing the mouse microbiome, going beyond just a correlation. Right. Yeah. Are the are the symptoms reversible in the mice model? We do, it's a good question. We don't know. Um, it's something that we're, we've been testing in a, in a number of contexts, uh, that we're currently testing in a number of contexts. Um, we don't know for sure. Uh, what we do know is in the germ-free system, which, which again is artificial, uh, the symptoms are reversible. And so what I mean by that is we can take an adult germ-free mouse, which has no microbiome, and we can give it a microbiome, and now it shows uh, uh, symptoms of Parkinson's. Yeah. And then we can do the reverse experiment where we take an adult, a, a regular Parkinson's mouse, if you will, with a microbiome uh, a, at an adult age and um, uh, uh, test the mouse and it shows behavioral deficits. And then we remove the microbiome and then the mouse no longer shows deficits. However, that's, again, these are artificial experiments. You, you would never make a person germ free, you can't, right? To, to, to uh, 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 reduce their symptoms of Parkinson's. So there are other ways that we need to approach this question in mice to hopefully understand if we can reverse the symptoms in humans. But if I can go maybe one step yeah. further, uh, I believe you know, reversing symptoms of neurodegeneration is going to be very challenging, yeah. right? Because at, by the time a person for let's say in the case of Parkinson's, by the time a person shows motor symptoms and they're diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's estimated that they've lost about 60, 70% of neurons in a particular region of their brain. And so if those neurons are already dead, it's going to be very hard to reverse those symptoms and to make the, you know, to make the, the, the motor symptoms come back or to make the motor performance improve. What I'm hopeful is that our approach and, and the research being done uh, by the community will allow us to either slow down the progression of Parkinson's or maybe stop the progression of Parkinson's. I think it's going to be very challenging to reverse the symptoms. Yeah, so you have another paper here, Sarkis, that gets into the sort of the mechanism of this. So uh, 2019, a gut bacterial amyloid promotes uh, motor impairment in mice. So you say amyloids are a class of protein with unique self-aggregation properties and their apparent accumulation can lead to cellular dysfunctions associated with neurodegenerative diseases. And so do we, do we have a reasonable understanding of the mechanism of how, how this happens? In, in that line of investigation, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that, that was published in the work, we believe we've identified one potential uh, trigger for for uh, Parkinson's, at least in again, at least tested in mice. There may be many others, yeah. um, but this is this is one. Um, and what we showed is that, um, as you mentioned, a bacterial amyloid is sufficient to induce all of the symptoms in the mouse model of Parkinson's. And the reason why this is relevant is that Parkinson's disease is very widely believed to be caused by aggregation of a neuronal protein called alpha-synuclein. And so what I mean by that is we all have a protein in our bodies, in our, in our neurons, called alpha-synuclein. Uh, it has a normal function uh, in the cell that, that's being investigated. But what happens with alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's patients is that it aggregates, it clumps, right? It forms like these large you know, masses of proteins, of the same protein, basically just sticks to itself, right? And when a cell 
has these large accumulations or these large uh, aggregates of proteins, it, it affects the function of the cell. And in some cases, those neurons, those cells will die. And that's what causes the neurodegeneration. And so the question in Parkinson's is what cause, if, if alpha-synuclein aggregation leads to you know, neuronal death and motor symptoms, then what causes synuclein, alpha-synuclein to aggregate in the first place? What makes things different in a Parkinson's patient rather than a healthy control if we all have alpha-synuclein, right? And so, of course, there's genetic factors, as we've already discussed, but what we showed in that paper is that a bacterial amyloid, which also self-aggregates, a bacterial protein which clumps, when that bacterial protein starts to aggregate or starts to stick to itself, it causes alpha-synuclein to start aggregating or to stick to itself. So it can initiate a cascade, it can initiate a set of events, essentially trigger that cascade um, by a bacterial protein, which ultimately leads to the human protein becoming aggregated. Well, so it's sort of like a catalyst for some sort of a reaction. I, th I, I believe you can view it that way, right? Is that it initiates the cascade as a catalyst uh, for, for uh, aggregation of alpha-synuclein. And then once alpha-synuclein starts aggregating, then that, that uh, uh, effect continues on its own. So when alpha-synuclein aggregates, it causes more uh, alpha-synuclein to aggregate. So again, you know, one, the, maybe the bacterial protein just starts the process and then the rest of it is aggregation of the of the neuronal protein of the human protein alpha synuclein. Is the so so two questions the, the microbial amyloids is that some sort of a waste product um, and and number two do we have some idea of sort of the critical quantity or concentration before problem starts? Uh, the bacterial amyloid is not a waste product. The bacterial amyloid is used by the bacteria for a particular function. It, it didn't evolve to, in my opinion, it didn't evolve to, to cause synuclein to aggregate or uh, it, it, in bacteria don't waste anything. They're, they're very, very efficient little machines. Um, and so that protein actually has a physiological function in the bacteria, which has nothing to do with alpha synuclein. So I think that, that once that protein aggregates, then it, you know, essentially, you know, causes synuclein to aggregate in the gut, and then yeah. that ultimately leads to synuclein aggregation in the brain. Um, uh, in terms of the quantity, we don't know. It's a very good question. We don't know the threshold or the quantity, and we also don't know who may be more susceptible to the effects of the bacterial protein than others. In other words, what is the genetic um, landscape of a person that is going to be susceptible to the effects of this bacterial amyloid. These are all things that we're trying to, to trying to understand. Yeah. So just like the AST, th this is a sort of a combination of genetic factors and the microbiome generated issues. And if they come together in some specific way, then the outcomes are, outcomes are bad. I believe, and certainly not all the effects yeah. of the microbiome, I believe many of the effects of the microbiome are uh, 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 based on the, the genetics of the individual. So again, these, as you just said, these are gene environment interactions um, yeah. in autism. I believe in autism. I believe in Parkinson's. I believe in many other disorders. These are gene environment interactions where the microbiome represents that environmental risk. Do we have, um, do, this is tough to get, I know, Sarkis, but do we have any data that shows, you know, some regions of the world where there is a genetic proclivity to, uh, let's say, Parkinson's or something like that, uh, but you don't see incidence rates to be as high because they have different um, dietary habits and, and different things. Do, do we have any data like that uh, worldwide geographically? Not to my knowledge, it may exist. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, an expert in epidemiology of Parkinson's, yeah. but it may exist. Um, uh, but I, I don't know of that literature. Yeah, yeah. We'll take a, we'll take a quick break, Sarkis. When we come back, we'll talk about some of your uh, more recent papers. Thank you. Thank you.
This is a scientific sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So Sarkis, uh, we are back. Uh, we were talking about the microbiome and the effects of microbiome on GI issues and possibly the neurodegenerative diseases like uh, Parkinson's and uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, you have a you have a review. You have a paper that's recently uh, came out. Uh, gut microbial molecules in behavioral and neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, you talked a bit about this. So um, uh, are we in a position to identify the specific molecules involved um, in the gut? Uh, we, we've become quite interested in understanding the molecular communication between the gut and the brain, uh, and specifically molecules produced by gut bacteria that might affect uh, neurological function and behavior. Uh, We have identified a handful of molecules that we believe don't just correlate with particular disorders or outcomes, but may actually contribute to them. Um, Maybe, you know, essentially the molecular output of an altered microbiome and its effects on an individual with with a susceptible genetic predisposition. And we've been working on a, a, a couple of these molecules and, um, and I'm, I can maybe share even some, some unpublished work with you, but we've um, essentially identified that molecules, small molecules produced by gut bacteria are found in the brains of mice. So they actually get out of the gut into the circulation or accumulate in the brain and can alter behavior and can alter neurodegeneration in animal models. Uh, and so, um, if if this is true, um, there, there could be some therapeutic approaches here, right? So, can we neutralize the, these things, or <laughs> how would you go about it? Uh, yes, there are, and and in fact, the, this is being translated into the clinic now. Uh, so, uh, I can maybe just briefly tell you about the the experiments that were done, and then and then update you on the, an ongoing clinical trial. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we've identified small molecules that um, are associated with autism spectrum disorder. Um, These are gut-derived molecules, so produced by gut bacteria that um, accumulate in the brains of mice. So we've tested these these hypotheses in mice. And what we've shown is that, uh, you know, one, at least for one specific molecule, that this microbial metabolite, this microbial molecule, can change the function of certain brain cells called oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are cells that myelinate neurons, and myelin on a neuron allows the the nerve cell to perform its function. Um, And therefore, what this um, uh, microbial metabolite does is it reduces the myelination on neurons by by inhibiting the maturation of oligodendrocytes. I know there's a, a lot of uh, uh, technical terms there, but essentially uh, this molecule slows down certain activities in the brain and then of mice, and then causes those mice to have anxiety and features of autism. Right, and there's more more to to the story that what I just described, but essentially. That is the circuit or the connection between the gut and the brain is through this one molecule that, again, is produced in the gut. So then how can one leverage this information or or exploit it to help people? And so I started a company several years ago called Axial Therapeutics. And what Axial has done, and this is the work of the scientists at Axial, this is not our work. We just gave them, you know, the, the scientists the information and what the scientists at Axial have done is formulated a drug, an oral therapeutic that absorbs or soaks up these molecules in the intestine. And so again, the accumulation of these molecules are causing negative behaviors in mice. 
So the hypothesis is that if you prevent, if you reduce their concentration systemically by absorbing them where they're produced in the gut, then you effectively get less concentration in the brain if, again, if this enters the brains of humans and can improve the behaviors. And so that's the idea, an oral sequestrant to essentially bind these, these microbial molecules in the gut and prevent them from ever leaving the gut. So 26 adolescents have been treated with this experimental therapy, uh, all with an ASC diagnosis. And what I can disclose is that the initial results look very positive, both in terms of improving the GI symptoms that you've mentioned, but also in terms of improving behaviors associated with autism. Uh, however, the, it, we need to be cautious because though this was a human trial and it showed uh, a good proof of concept, it was an open label trial. In other words, there was no placebo control. And there, and obviously, psychiatric disorders are prone to placebo effects. And so the next step, so this was a, a very, very good start, I believe, of translating mouse research into humans because we we're able to get an initial positive signal in humans. The next step is now to perform a, a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded study, which is the gold standard of knowing whether or not this approach will work to improve the lives of individuals with autism. If it does, I believe this will be a, a, a huge benefit to the autism community. I believe that it's going to potentially be a, a game changer because there are no drugs for the core symptoms of autism. There's no therapeutics for the core symptoms of autism. It's a major medical and social unmet need. And, and we're hopeful that we can help uh, individuals with autism by using this novel approach. Yeah, so would, would it be correct, uh, Sarkis, and if I, uh, let me see if I understand, th these molecules that are produced in the gut um, when, when uh, certain bacteria are present, uh, they're not really toxic to other organs in the body, but if they get into the brain, they are sort of toxic to the neurons. So, so, so that, that is what we are seeing? Um, honestly, we don't know if they're toxic to other, other regions, uh, other organs of the body uh, oh. or not, because we've only looked in the brain because our initial studies focused on behavior. It very well, uh, you know, these molecules, before, again, before they get to the brain, they're in the circulation. And so in theory, they are exposed to, you know, many organs in the body are exposed to, to these same molecules. And we have neurons everywhere in our body, right? We have nerve cells everywhere in our body. Our heart beats, our lungs, you know, your muscles contract all because of, of neurons. So in theory, there could be effects outside of the brain. We've just never studied them. Are these molecules very reactive? Is that the problem? What do you mean by reactive? Sorry. They, they, um, they, they react with stuff a lot, lot faster. You know, we don't know much about the chemistry of the molecule. We know the identity of the molecule. We don't know if, it, you know, if it, you know, that that chemical changes into other chemicals. We don't know what the receptors are. We don't know, again, what other tissues are affected. Um, we focused on the brain, but you do bring up a good point is, um, you know, there are other tissues to to investigate. And it's it's interesting because... Children with autism have, it's, you know, they have many uh, uh, peripheral features or, or non-brain features. Again, autism itself is diagnosed by behavior, right? But if you talk to parents who have children with autism, they'll tell you that they have many, they have balance issues, motor coordination issues, strength issues, um, heart rate issues. And so in theory, and again, this is all speculative, but in theory, the, the, the same mechanisms can be altering neuronal activity outside the brain as well. We just, again, we just haven't studied that yet. Yeah, yeah. So I want to finish up with your uh, recent review article, The Gut Microbiota Brain Access in Behavior and Brain Disorders. You say in a striking display of trans kingdom symbiosis, gut bacteria cooperate with their animal hosts to regulate the development and function of the immune, metabolic, and nervous systems. 
through dynamic bike directional communication along the, the gut brain axis. When I uh, when I read about this, uh, Sarkis, I obviously don't know much about this. You know, I feel like um, bacteria, obviously, one of the most successful biological entities, as far as we know, in the universe. Uh, humans appear to be sort of an enclosure <laughs> for, for the bacteria to thrive uh, because they seem to be able to control the brain. They they seem to be able to do a lot of things inside the human body. You know, it's not it's not surprising, right? Because bacteria shape ecosystems around the world, right, around the globe, both on land and in oceans. And this has been studied for many years. We are just one more ecosystem. We are just one more environment for bacteria. Again, bacteria are constantly impacting the, the environment around them. And if, and if you think about what a bacteria wants, if you will, what a bacteria wants to do is to make more bacteria, right? And we offer them a nutri our intestines offer them a nutrient rich, moist, well controlled, warm environment. It, it's it, this is like nirvana for a bacteria <laughs> to live in our intestines. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so they replicate. They, but but the idea, uh, and I don't know if it's speculation or not, that you can actually get a human to eat the the the, the right things um, by by promoting certain things uh, by by communicating with the brain from the gut. Is that has that been proven? It has not been proven. There are certain animal models which suggest that various forms of feeding behaviors and food preference may be modulated by gut bacteria. Um, to my knowledge, there isn't any credible evidence in humans. Uh, the closest would come, it wouldn't be food preference, the closest uh, you know, uh, impact of the microbiome uh, on this area would be um, so the, the, the production of, of, of leptin and ghrelin, which impacts uh, c food consumption, um, mm -hmm. but not food preference. Yeah. OK. OK. So so in conclusion, Sarkis, I know that you have done a lot of work in this area. So if you look forward five years, where do you think we are most likely to make a, a huge impact? Um, and, and, and specifically in the area of uh, microbiome and brain related uh, or neurodegenerative issues that we talked about? Um, I, I think, again, we're still very early, uh, but I think that there's uh, optimism that um, we would be able to control various aspects of inflammation uh, throughout the body and in the brain by modulating the microbiome. We, you know, I think the effects on, you know, the nervous system are going to be, are going to require more work, direct effects on, on the nervous system are going to require more work. But yeah. um, in terms of the immune response throughout the body, including the brain, uh, I believe that there's much more evidence that we know enough about certain bacteria and their molecules to be able to tune the immune system in a way that may be beneficial for health and disease. Um, but the uh, other aspect of, of this, which is important, is again, if we take this assumption that by feeding a certain probiotic or by removing a certain organism or its molecules, we can tune the immune system, we can make it either pro or less inflammatory. Um, yeah. What's important to remember is that this feature goes beyond just infection and inflammation. The immune response controls many aspects of our metabolism. The immune system you know, communicates with our nervous system. So the immune, by modulating the immune system, it may be a conduit, it may be a mechanism to access other organ systems in the body. And so I, I know I didn't give you a specific answer because I think that's very challenging at this point, but yeah. I would say the most promising area in a neck that we would be able to have substantial progress in the next five years is impacts on the immune system through the microbiome. Yeah, the, these molecules that, that, that you're following, um, do they provide us some avenues for diagnostics, early diagnostics? They do, they do. Uh, we and others have, are looking at that as well in, in different contexts um, yeah. because, you know, one can, 
uh, profile the microbiome through DNA sequencing. And so, so that is the, the gold standard way of, of, of identifying a person's microbiome and, and um, profiling a person's microbiome is to sequence the DNA of the bacteria. But that doesn't tell you what the bacteria are producing, when they're producing it, how much they're producing. So I think looking at the molecules that bacteria produce may be more insightful to understanding biology of the, the organisms that harbor those, those microbes. Right. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, uh, Sarkis. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you very much, Go. Thank you.